Uh, Captain Paul Watson is, of course, the founder and executive director of Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. He's been defending and protecting animals worldwide for over 30 years. His commitment and tenacity in this endeavor is legendary, as we know. And Paul's uncompromising devotion to his marine conservation uh, mission has been an inspiration to many people uh, in the animal movement as well as many people sitting here in this room. I am pleased to welcome him tonight for our closing keynote. Please welcome Paul Watson. Broadcasters and other media people. 
It was the first media organization, the first organization to understand that the medium is the message. And why, what I mean by that is that they decided that, you know, we, by understanding media, you have to understand that the, the media doesn't care about the truth, never has, never will, just as governments don't really care about the truth. It's all about manipulation. And so with the media, you have to understand that there's only four elements to any media story. Sex, scandal, violence, or celebrity. If you don't have one of those elements, you don't have a story. And if you have all four elements, you got a story that just never seems to go away. <laughs> and so if you want to get information about how to, about what's happening to animals or to the environment, it's very difficult to get facts and figures across to the media because they're not interested. It's not sexy enough. It's not dramatic. You have to inject human interest. You have to put in drama. So in 1975, when Robert Hunter and I put ourselves in front of a Russian harpoon vessel in order to block the harpoon, and the harpoon was fired over our heads, and that shot was carried around the world, that was the beginning of that kind of activism that for the first time people became aware of it. Not that they cared about whales, but because they saw people willing to risk their lives to protect whales. That became a story. And uh, we've had to carry on with that sort of uh, train ever since. Back in 1984, when we were trying to stop the slaughter of wolves in uh, British Columbia, we had a story which, uh, which we carried in the headlines for over two weeks. Why? Because we had the violence of them shooting wolves from helicopters. We had the, uh, the threat of them. They were going to kill us if we interfered. So we had the violent thing down pretty good. Uh, then we had the scandal of a, of, a, of a British Columbia environment minister taking a bribe from a big game hunting organization to do this. So we had scandal and violence. So to round that up and make it a super story, I recruited Bo Derek as our spokesperson. <laughs> And uh, at the press conference, one reporter for the Vancouver Sun said, well, what's about Derek and all about wolves? This is ridiculous having her as your spokesperson. She doesn't know anything about this. I said, well, you know, we don't make the rules. We just play the game. <laughs> if I had the best wolf biologist in the world here, I'd be an empty room. Nobody would be listening to it. It would be a story. <laughs> but I see the room is packed. Um, in fact, there were more people in that room than there are in this room right now. <laughs> And uh, it will be the headline story of your newspaper tomorrow. You're going to write it. That's where it's going to be. <laughs> and uh, because if you can control those four elements, you dictate the story. So ever since that, we've always felt, and other organizations, of course, have understood the value of having celebrity spokespeople. Because we live in a culture where the people who have the most credibility are people who pretend to be somebody they're not. <laughs> And over the years, over the years we've had to develop that. You always have to come up with new tactics. You always have to push the envelope. So in 1979, when we hunted down and ran the Pirate Whaler Sierra, big story. It was a headline story around the, around the world. The next time I ran the vessel, I ran the whaling vessel, wasn't so big. I had to go, we had to sink two of them. <laughs> you got to keep escalating it to make the story alive. And uh, until so what we've managed to develop right now over all the years is our own TV show. And the reason that uh, that happened or that came apart is that, uh, about is that I went to all of the networks, all of them actually, to push this story. And I said, uh, you know, the biggest show on Discovery right now is a bunch of guys going out into a remote area of the ocean in very rough water and catching crabs. <laughs> That's it. We can give you men and women from around the world going to even more remote areas in even rougher water to save whales. It's got to be no problem. <laughs> and we'll throw in some icebergs and penguins and, uh, you know, to, to make it a, the scenery will be much better. So uh, they all rejected the show. Every single one of them rejected the show. Thought it was a great idea, but oh, a little too risky. And uh, then Marjorie Kaplan, who uh, was in the meeting when we pitched it, she then became president of uh, Animal Planet, and she decided, she called us back and said, well, let's go for it, and that uh, we put the show on last year, and it became the number one show on Animal Planet. <laughs> and 
what I found most amazing about it is now, it isn't a show that's just watched by people who agree with us. It's seen by people all over the world. It's now been shown in almost every country except Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, and it will be shown there this year, the first season. So it's gone worldwide. And because our ships are vegan vessels, and have been for years, that message is brought across in that television show. And it makes life a lot easier. For instance, uh, a month ago I was coming back uh, from Canada into the U.S. and uh, they stopped me and told me I had to step aside and sit down. And I said, what's the problem? And they said, well, you know, we, you know we'll just have, you know, we'll, you have to wait a couple hours. And I said, did Japan put in some complaint for, about us? And they said, well, yeah, they, they did. And, but the interesting thing about it was all the Homeland Security guys were Whale Wars fans. They'd all <laughs> And I said, well, so what's going on? And uh, and said, well, Japan's accused you of being a terrorist. <laughs> and I go, oh, well, what's that mean? Am, am I off to Guantanamo or something? <laughs> and he looked at me and said, oh, it doesn't really mean a hell of a lot. It just means we got these damn protocols and paperwork that we have to go through, and then you'll be free to go. <laughs> so now what happens is when I come into the country, I'm met at the plane by a Homeland Security guy who then walks me up to the front of the line and I'm actually getting through before everybody else is. <laughs> but to show you how strange this world is, you know, uh, just a few days ago, coming in from, from Europe, uh, I went through there and the Homeland Security guy checks us out. You know, and going through our bags and they're all very friendly. And just before I go, he says, why don't you guys use torpedoes? <laughs>
They're targeting endangered whales in an established whale sanctuary in violation of a global moratorium on whaling and in contempt of an Australian federal court order in violation of the Antarctic Treaty, in violation of the Convention of the International Trade in Endangered Species, in violation of the United States Packwood Magnets and Appellee Amendment, on and on and on. These people are criminals. They are no different than elephant poachers in Africa, except that they are the elephant poachers are black and poor. That's the only difference. But they have power. They have a lot of power. And what they've been doing is leaning on every government that supports us to try and, you know, we, we just finished our second audit because of the IRS, because of this. And uh, we had one like three years ago, and then we had another one. And uh, they take away our flags, and the ship can't sail without a flag. We lost the Canadian flag, the Belize flag, the Cayman Islands flag, the British flag. And now we sail under the Dutch flag. Now the. The great thing about the Dutch is that once a Dutch ship is registered as a Dutch ship, the Dutch government has no power to take the flag away. It's a very strange sort of situation, but one that works for our advantage. <laughs> but to show you how, how much power the Japanese are influencing or are exerting is that uh, the Netherlands is now saying they want to take the flag away and they're going to pass special legislation just to do this. But we're fighting that right now. So. Uh, I think we'll be able to retain the flag at least through the next uh, the next campaign. We do fly another flag, and if anybody has seen Whale Wars, seen the purple and white flag that we fly on the stern, that is the flag of the five nations of the Iroquois. And they gave us that flag when they found that everybody is taking the flag away from us. But unfortunately, governments don't recognize the Iroquois flag. But we're proud. That's the flag we're most proud to fly. So we literally cost the Japanese whaling fleets hundreds of millions of dollars because one whale can be worth anywhere from three quarters to one million dollars. So every time you say just in the last year, that's about three hundred million dollars worth of uh, uh, the losses to them. And of course, the Japan it doesn't end just with the with the whales. It's also the dolphin slaughter. And thanks to, to some of you may have seen the code here that uh, that's another battle I think that we can win because. We can win these things as long as we're persistent, as long as we never surrender and never retreat and keep the pressure on year after year after year. And sometimes it takes decades and decades. And this year, we finally achieved a major victory against the Canadian seal hunt with the announcement by the European Parliament to ban seal products into Europe. And uh, this year they took 20% of the quota. And instead of getting a focal 20%, they have no market for that. Next year it will be far better. Um, of course, they'll continue to kill seals because East Coast Canadians, where I'm from, are a bunch of savage barbarians. And I say that literally. They are. If you've met any of these people who live in the Magdalen Islands, the outports of Newfoundland, they are barbarians. In fact, Mickey Dwyer, a sealer, wrote a book called Over the Side, Mickey. And he's quoted in that book as saying, uh, the animal rights people say we're barbarians. And you know what? They're right. Yeah. You have to be a barbarian to do what we do out there. And of course, he's reformed now. And strangely enough, his nephew married my niece, so we're sort of a late. <laughs> I used to pride myself of having a relative in every province of Canada except Newfoundland. Now I can't say that anymore. <laughs> no, but to be, to be fair on that, that uh, the, the people are, are changing. I also wrote an incredible book called Sea of Heartbreak about the fishing industry of Canada. So I actually recommend Mickey's books because he was a fisherman, he was a sealer, and if we said any of the things that Mickey writes about in his book, nobody would believe us. It's far worse than anything we've seen, and far worse than anything that we've described. And as one Magdalen Island sealer said to, said to me one time, I ah, ain't about the money, you know, it's about getting away from the old lady, getting out there on the, on the ice, drinking some beers with the boys and killing things, you know? That's what it's all about. <laughs> they actually take pleasure from doing it, just as the Faroese take pleasure from slaughtering pilot whales. This is the sixth side of humanity that we're really fighting. It's this sort of natural sociopathic behavior that uh, people wage war against other species and against nature. And uh, 
why they do this, why don't why do serial killers kill people? We don't know. And it's the same reason that people do this kind of uh, behavior. Most of the time, I think that hunters have uh, some very severe emotional and sexual problems as well. <laughs> I was debating actually, I was debating a big game hunter one time, and uh, he's a doctor, and, uh, and uh, he said, well, you know, Watson, the problem with this is you don't understand, you don't understand where we're coming from. Uh, we're in touch with our roots, you know, and you're not. Um, we come from a hunting gathering background, and, uh, and I'm trying to keep that, keep that connection. I said, well, what how many gathering associations are you a member of? <laughs> I said, you know what I think? I think that anybody that has to go kill a beautiful animal to stick its head up on the wall has got some very serious sexual and psychological problems. What are yours? Oh, then he lost his course. <laughs> But this has been a good year because not only have we seen a major achievement with the, uh, with the SEAL campaign and uh, the, with the release of the coal, we're putting a lot of pressure on the Japanese. We're costing them that. We're, and in many areas around the world, where we are achieving uh, results. And that has got nothing to do with governments. It's got nothing to do with big organizations. What it has everything to do with is the passion of individuals, you and I and the people who are involved in this movement. That is what is making a difference. It is the passion of individuals. And that is the only thing that has ever changed anything in the entire history of social movements. You know, slavery was ended by the efforts of people like Porter, Force, and Douglas. Women got the right to vote, not because of President Wilson, who took credit for it, but because of all of the suffragettes who had to go to prison and, and uh, pay, you know, suffer physically for that. That's what makes a difference. Uh, governments are just around to cause the problems and take credits for solving them. That's, that's all they do. And I don't know how many people have told me, well, you have to go into politics. Why? That would be the end of my career. Go into politics, yeah. You know, Mark Twain once called it the, the Parliament of Whores. That's what he called the U.S. Congress, and he certainly had reason to say that. But uh, you don't solve anything uh, by going into, uh, into politics. But uh, what we do make a difference is when you individually champion something that you have a uh, passion for in your heart. And that can be anything from you know, protecting uh, uh, domestic animals on farms like uh, chickens or, or, or cows or pigs or protecting the great whales or protecting the orangutans or protecting a, a habitat that they live in. That's all of those little things combined is what makes a movement. A movement is one of diversity. And it's these individuals all over the world, hundreds of thousands of them, that are really making these changes. But the real question is, are we going to make the changes in time? Because when it comes to the oceans, we're in a very, very serious situation. The oceans are dying. Jacques Cousteau said before he died, the oceans are dying in our time. He said if the navies of the world had any sense of responsibility, they would be protecting our oceans instead of playing their silly, stupid little war games with each other. You know, we're killing whales and dolphins with the U.S. Navy. Why? To test sonar, which is used to detect enemy submarines. Al-Qaeda does not have any submarines. <laughs> There's nobody out there who does have it. But the way the military works is that they budget something 15, 20 years ago, and they're still on budget, and they're going to spend that money and make the weapon, even though it's no longer, it's, it's, it now is that it's obsolete. So they're continually spending money on useless equipment, which is used to destroy nature. But the oceans are dying, and fisheries are primarily responsible for it. The single most destructive ecological occupation on this planet right now is fishermen. Fishermen is the most evil occupation on this planet right now. Why? Because the fishermen have the ability and the potential to destroy all life on this planet as we know it. Or at least they certainly have the, the potential to destroy human civilization. And why that is, is because if they fish out the ocean, and the oceans collapse, the entire marine ecosystems collapse, and the oceans die, we all die. It's as simple as that. 80% of our oxygen comes from phytoplankton in the oceans. There's a relationships, a very, very complex relationships in the oceans between all these living organisms. 
Uh, when you, the Canadian government looks at the east coast of Canada, they see three things, seals, fish, and people. That's all they see. But a simplified food chart, uh, food chain of the east coast of the, of the Pacific, on the Atlantic Ocean will show over a thousand species that are interconnected with each other. And that is a very complex system. It isn't fish, and seals, and people. It's over a thousand species. And every time you pop one of those species out of the chain, you weaken the entire system. I guess another way of looking at it is look at, look at what we're on. We're on a spaceship right now. We're in, we're in a spaceship called Spaceship Earth. We're hurtling through the universe at incredible speeds, and our atmosphere is the hull of that spaceship. And every species on this planet is a rivet in the hull of the biosphere that keeps it intact. It is the life support system of the spaceship. And if you keep popping rivets, the hull's going to collapse. And when it collapses, everything's going to fall apart. But this is far too abstract for most people to understand because we've been raised in a culture which teaches us to live in a world of fantasy. To, we have alienated ourselves from the entire uh, realm of the natural world. We're apart from it. It's an abstraction. And uh, just look at what our values are, what we fight for. We're always talking about, oh, we've got to be non-violent and everything. But meanwhile, we're going around killing people for oil. We're going around killing people for territory and everything. We justify violence when it's in our interest to do so. And then we condemn it when it's not in our interest to do so. The human species is an incredibly violent species. Always has been. Still is. But it has an incredible ability to justify that violence when it suits its purposes. And that violence is around us every day. From the slaughterhouses to the, the wars that are being waged, all for resources, all for power, and we justify that all the time, every day. There's no such thing as a non-violent culture. Everything is revolving around violence. The, the, the thing is what we have to do is control that violence. We have to understand what our, so, our natural sociopathic be, behavior is and control it. And to control it, we have to accept it, the fact that we're that we're a violent species. And that's a difficult thing to do, but we are gonna to have to do so or else it's the end, really. Uh, right now, 90% of all of the fishes in the oceans have been removed, 90% from what it was before we started waging war on life in the oceans, 90%. We're taking 70 to 90 million sharks out of the oceans every year. They cannot sustain that kind of, uh, of an assault. We look on fishes, and I'm speaking as a, as a society as a whole. We look on fish as fish. They're just fish. They're all individuals. A salmon might take four years to become sexually mature, then it dies. An orange roughy doesn't even become sexually mature until it's 40 and lives to be 150. Halibut's lived to be about 200 years of age. Lobsters can be lived to be 200 years of age. They're not getting that, that, that old anymore. 110 years ago, the average size of a northern cod was above a meter and a half. Now it's 14 inches. You know, they don't, we're killing them off before they can get anywhere. The entire culture of all of these species is being eradicated and destroyed. Sharks have, have uh, formulated evolution in the ocean for 450 million years. Every fish that's in the ocean, its camouflage, its speed, what it does has been, it's that way because of the shark. The shark has has uh, guided evolution in that way, as the, as the apex predator in the, in the sea. And uh, if the sharks disappear, we have some serious problems with the rest of the fish. 20 years from now, there will not be a single coral reef on this planet. That's already been determined. Two weeks ago, there was a conference on coral reefs, and they came out with the, the conclusion, it's irreversible. It cannot be stopped. All coral reef marine ecosystems will be dead in 20 years. That is the first major failing of a major ecosystem on this planet. It cannot be reversed. And that's the first one. Where do we stop this? The Amazon? The Redwood Forest? If we don't stop it soon, it's going to start escalating. We live in a period which now scientists have called the Holocene. And that is an extinction event. There's been five major extinction events in the history of this planet. The last one was 65 million years ago with the extinction of the dinosaurs when we lost 90% of the oceans. And so with, with that major 
what we're living in right now, between the year 2000 and 2065, we will lose more species of plants and animals than we've lost in the last 65 million years. So that rate of extinction is unprecedented. And that's why it's called the Homocene, because we will be responsible. We are responsible for that. But for the most part, you won't read this in the newspaper. It's not on television. As the poet Leonard Cohen once said, we're locked into our suffering, and our pleasures are the seal. In other words, we're too busy entertaining ourselves to understand what we're doing to ourselves. And as long as we continue to do that, then it's going to be very difficult. That's one of the reasons we're trying to do television shows, I guess, which try and get that message across. But I don't know if we can really do enough, because even when you're dealing with Discovery and Animal Planet, it's all about Shark Week or, you know, scaring the hell out of you about these people. By the way, the number of shark attacks on human beings every year is five. Five. Usually a case of mistaken identity. Sharks do not attack people. They don't like us. We don't taste it. <laughs> the number of, of uh, casualties or victims uh, that are killed every year by ostriches, 100. <laughs> ostriches are 20 times more dangerous than sharks. <laughs> It's more dangerous to play golf than it is to swim with, with sharks because more people are struck and killed by lightning on golf courses every year than are attacked and killed by sharks while swimming with them. So what happens is what we've done is what we've taken the shark and made a monster out of it and then we justify its, uh, its, its, uh, its slaughter. The main product that's being made out of sharks right now is shark fin soup, which has no nutritive value at all. They're being killed as a status symbol, and as people become more and more affluent in China, there's more and more demand for shark fins. And when we talked to some Chinese people over this, they said, well, you know, you're going to wipe them out, then what are you going to do? Well, then we'll have to deal with it. But right now, we want shark fin soup because this is what we have at our weddings and such and such. Again, it's this alienation from nature. We've created these entire fantasy worlds that we live in. Where, for instance, uh, we don't have to worry, people tell me, we don't have to worry about saving the planet. We're all going to go to heaven or hell if we're bad, I suppose. Of course, everybody's going to hell because every religion that believes in hell believes that you're going to go to hell if you don't believe in their religion. So that means that since everybody believes in hell, <laughs> anybody is religious, I apologize, but we will not find any reference to heaven or hell in the Bible. It doesn't exist. It was all made up by two poets a thousand years ago, Dante and Milton, and we now believe it. So we make up fantasies and people begin to believe it. So that means that a thousand years from now, we'll be believing, if we're still around, we'll be believing in the Jedi Knights. <laughs> and forget about Jesus had been risen from the dead, Elvis is seen by more people risen from the dead than anybody ever saw Jesus Christ. He will be the Son of God, or God. These are the kind of silly things that we, we teach ourselves to believe, teach our children to believe in, and this is why we're alienated from, from, the, uh, from nature. It is no secret that Satan has been designed with hooves, uh, cloven hooves and horns and a tail because he was taken directly from the Greek god of nature, Pan. And so, said nature became evil, nature became Satan. So we wage war on nature ever since. And this is where we've got to turn it around and realize that we have to protect nature, we have to protect endangered species, and we have to learn in harmony. We have to learn to live within the, 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 the boundaries of the three basic laws of ecology, the law of interdependence, the law of diversity, and the law of finite resources. Because what's going to happen in this century is a total biological or ecological collapse. It's going to happen within the next hundred years. And of course, all the people who say, oh, you know, you guys are all a bunch of doom and gloom Cassandras, forget one thing. Cassandra was all doom and gloom, but she was right. And all, all that uh, King Priam had to do was listen to his daughter, and it could have all been reversed. He could have saved Troy. And the same thing is today, if we just listen to the people who are, who, are, who, are, who are saying, making these predictions, we'll be able to turn it all around, or at least try and salvage something of it. But that isn't going to happen, because uh, human beings have this incredible ability to only adapt when put under extreme pressure. And that means that when everything starts collapsing, then we'll say, oh, maybe we're going to have to deal with this situation. 
So what we have to do in our capacity as people who understand that is to be prepared and also to, uh, you know, to teach our children to be prepared and to understand that the world is going to change in a very radical, radical way. And, uh, you know, people always call what we do, all of us, radicals. We're not radicals. We're conservatives. You don't get more conservative than a conservationist, by the way. George yeah. <laughs> Radicals, fishermen are radicals, the people who are destroying this planet are radicals, people who are trying to protect the planet are conservatives. You're conserving, that's the root word, conservatives. And so it really all comes down to that. Um, what each and every one of us is doing in our various fields is equally important. And we should always remember that. What we have to do to make a movement is to each of us use our own talents, our own skills, our own abilities, our own imagination to make it a better world for tomorrow. And so it doesn't matter if you're a, a you know, you're a lawyer or a teacher or a, or a writer or a nurse or a doctor, anything. It doesn't matter what you do, as long as you do it for the future, not just for yourself. And that's what makes a very strong movement. It's all of these people and organized, small organizations all around the world working together that makes this movement what it is. And it has come a long ways. In 1972, we put up four billboards in Vancouver, and it had big letter in yellow on it said ecology. And underneath of it, it said, look it up. <laughs> then get involved. Nobody knew what the word meant. 1980. Nobody knew what the word vegan was. If you said you were a vegan, they thought you were from the planet of Vega, but the fact that nobody knew what it meant. So we've come a long way. People know what the word vegan means now. And in fact, uh, you know, even in Paris, there are vegan restaurants, which is pretty unusual. Uh, if anybody's been to Paris, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but it's, so veganism in restaurants and that is actually uh, going around the world, that people are becoming more and more aware of it. So it is a it is a movement that is changing things. It's making people aware that uh, that these changes are more than just animal rights. It's the rights for this entire planet to survive. It's environmentalism. It's conservationism. All of that the same. You cannot be an environmentalist without being a vegetarian or a vegan. You cannot be. Al Gore did not deserve that Nobel Prize. No. No. I just think about a couple more things just to, to consider is that when it comes to the connection between the oceans and uh, the killing of animals for, for, for slaughter to eat, and that is the pig now is the largest aquatic predator on the planet. More efficient at being caught and fed to pigs than uh, is eaten by sharks. One third of all of the fish taken out of the ocean is fed to animals. One third. And uh, chickens are now eat chickens in Europe are now eating more fish than all of the puffins and albatrosses in the world combined. We're killing off the puffins. They're dying of starvation in the North Atlantic, so we can catch small sand eels, which the puffins eat and grind them up in the fish meal to feed to chickens on factory farms in Denmark. That's the connection. We have uh, domestic house cats are eating more tuna fish than all the world's seals combined. 2.5 million tons of fish is being fed to cats every year, which is really strange when you think about it because the tuna fish is not the natural prey of a cat. If the two ever came in together, the tuna fish would eat the cat. So, we shouldn't be feeding tuna fish to cats or to people. We have the save the dolphin, you know, dolphin free tuna. We need tuna free tuna. <laughs> the bluefin tuna, the fastest and most incredible fish that's ever evolved, is now facing extinction. And rather than save it, what is Mitsubishi doing? The company that's in charge of most of the fisheries buying as much as they possibly can. They're investing in extinction. All of these fish are being frozen and warehoused. Last year, the European common, the European community said that the quota for bluefin tuna in the Mediterranean was 15,000 tons. 
No, that's what the scientists recommended. They set the quota at 23,000 tons, despite what the scientists recommended. The actual take, 64,000 tons. The tuna, the bluefin tuna, will be extinct within five years. And all, and it'll still be available. You can buy it from Mitsubishi. And they'll have it available for the next 15 to 20 years, and they will be the exclusive source, and they, people will pay top dollar for it. I was at a free and fish market last two weeks ago. Turbot, 28 euros a kilo. 20 years ago, nobody ate it. It was called a trash fish, not to insult the turbot, but nobody ate it. It was a garbage fish, they called it. It, was, it has no taste. But now we're paying 28 euros a kilo. Why? Because it's adaptation to diminishment. We adapt to diminishment. As we lose one species of fish, we adapt to the next one. And I used to joke that we're going to get to the point where we're going to be eating jellyfish. And then I went to an event recently in Vancouver where they were serving jellyfish, jellyfish salad. So that's the first step on the door for that. And uh, so it's constantly this adaptation to diminishment. And anybody who uh, was alive in the 60s will recognize this one. If I was in 1968, if I were to say to you, you know, in 30, 40 years, you're going to be buying water in bottle, plastic bottles. <laughs> and you're going to be paying more for that water than the equivalent amount of gasoline. You would have looked at me like, yeah, you're a complete idiot. That's never going to happen. Why would anybody pay money for water? It comes out of a tap. And I just saw recently a bottle of water in a hotel for $12. That was one liter. Where people are paying $12 for a liter. That is adaption to diminishment. That is insanity. <laughs> and that, but this is the problem. We are constantly adapting to, to diminishment. And people are, and this is one of the reasons, of course, we have the financial crisis we're in, too, because I guess it's all fantasy land and economics land. You know, and uh, we're spending money that nobody has and, uh, and just making more. But uh, so, one of the reasons that I've been able to adapt and get by without actually having any stress in my life is this one little thing. Back in 1975, after seeing a whale die before my eyes, I came to the conclusion that the human species is insane. <laughs> so therefore I don't take anything that anybody says seriously. That means we're immune to criticism. So when people criticize us, I said, well, so we don't represent you. Our clients are whales. <laughs> Find us a whale that disagrees with what I said, and we'll think about it. <laughs> but until then, nothing any human being has to say means anything to us. You know, you're part of the problem. It says Pogo, that character in the uh, comic books a few years ago, once said, "We've met the enemy, and the enemy is us." And so that's why we're, we're in a war with ourselves, trying to change ourselves, and uh, because we're the most dangerous species that's ever lived upon this planet and we're especially dangerous to ourselves. So that's what we're trying to, to turn around. Uh, so when people criticize what we're doing, we just say, I don't care. You know, when people criticize us on whale horses, well, your crew will all seem to be uh, inexperienced. Yeah. <laughs> well, you shouldn't be going, you should have professional crew members. Why? <laughs> well, because they know what they're doing. Oh, yeah. But it's pretty hard to find. I cannot pay people to do what my volunteers do. You know, professional crew members, they want union wages and they're not going to take the risks and it's not going to happen. So I do what I do with the resources of people I have available. And here's the interesting thing. In 30 years, we've never had a crew member injured. So with our inexperienced crew, how come nobody's ever injured? Because we take extra precautions. And all of our crew are so concerned that, you know, that this is dangerous that they take those extra precautions. So what I find really, really uh, hilarious, uh, ironic in a way, is we're being accused of being inexperienced and we're going to get somebody hurt. In the last four years, the Japanese whaling fleet has had three fatalities. One major fire, an oil spill, and over two dozen accidents uh, where people were seriously injured. We haven't had any of those. They're professionals. <laughs> so that's why we don't really pay too much attention to, to criticism.
All we're concerned about is getting the job done, and that means the bottom line, costing the money and saving the lives of those individual species, of those individual animals, and therefore also protecting the species. That's what is important. Names, name calling means nothing. They can call me anything they want. They can call my crew anything they want. And just to finish off, I'd just like to say that we're going to be returning uh, to Antarctica in December. Uh, this new operation is called Operation Waltzy Matilda. We've got a lot of hostility from the uh, Australian government, so we're trying to, uh, we've got an incredibly overwhelming support from the Australian people. So to tie ourselves in closer to the Australian people, we decided to use their unofficial national anthem. Uh, and then our, our logo this year is a, is a kangaroo with a patch carrying a trident. But we're going back to we're going back, we're going back to this new world. And we've also now got ourselves, I'm going to show you the pictures of it, uh, a new super weapon for this year. Uh, one of the problems we've had is we couldn't catch the, the, the Japanese harpoon vessels because they're faster than the steamer. And all we could do is block the uh, we all we could do is block the uh, factory ship. So our new uh, interceptor vessel uh, is called the Earth Race. And it just won the, uh, it set the world record for going around the world in record time. And this is it. <laughs> it's all really scared the hell out of the Japanese. <laughs> this has 55 knots. And we'll be able to block the harpoons on that whaling, on the whaling vessel. We're also going to put LREDs on it so we can use our own weapons against them. <laughs> this is a Kevlar, uh, a Kevlar uh, carbon fiber hull. Uh, so it's very strong. This, this vessel can actually go off of the top of the swell and completely submerge itself and come up on the other side. <laughs> it's not the most comfortable boat in the world, but it will get the job done. And uh, we're also now working on getting a, a second vessel. Uh, a, a second larger vessel, hopefully like a Navy frigate type vessel, so we'll expand the Neptune's Navy into uh, two large ships plus uh, this uh, interceptor vessel here. <laughs> we, expect, we expect that this year it will be probably our most dangerous mission because Japan is becoming so increasingly uh, frustrated by the, their losses, and that they have to make a profit this year or else they're going to have some very serious economic situations to deal with. So our objective is to make sure they don't get that profit. Their objective is to try and prevent us from preventing them from getting that profit. So it's going to be very serious. They, they now threaten to send down military vessels to defend their whaling vessels, and they just passed a law saying that they can fire at will upon any pirate vessel, and they, they say that they can describe us as pirate vessels. Well, here's the thing. If they start doing things like that, then that's going to backlash. So we realize that the risks we're taking, but uh, we're not going to back down from their threats. We're going to go right into it. As John Paul Jones once said, give me a ship and I will sail it into harm's way. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to sail into harm's way for the whales. And uh, we're going to protect them with the best of our ability. And uh, we're well aware of those risks. But when people say, and when people say to us, how can you ask people to risk their life, their lives? How can you ask people to risk their lives for a whale? They're amazed. I mean, amazed that they ask that question. Yeah. We don't ask that question if people are over there defending some sheep's oil well in Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> we give medals to people for that. <laughs> oh yes, they're fighting for democracy. That's right. <laughs> that is the name of the oil province of the oil companies. <laughs> Don't even have a democracy anymore. What we have is an oil, they crack, ugly, arcane government by the oil companies, for the oil companies. But uh, this is what, this is certainly it's a far more noble legacy. To risk your life to protect an endangered species, to risk your life to protect the habitat, to risk your life to protect another human being, or to risk your life to protect another living, sentient creature on this planet. That is worth dying for.
injure anybody, didn't steal anybody's property. They're in jail for the crime of compassion. And in our world today, that is considered by the powers to be to be one of the most insidious crimes, the crime of compassion, because it undermines everything they stand for. And uh, these people are real heroes. And uh, I think that what we should do is try and do everything we can get, can, can, can to get them the best possible lawyers to try and get them out of where, where they're at right now. More importantly, to keep the pressure on to stem Huntington Life Sciences into the ground and make that business, that business extinct. <laughs> now, I think we're going to do it the same way we're going to save the whales persistence, persistence, persistence. As Woody Allen once said, 90% of success is just being there. Just staying there, never giving up. And if the movement to shut down hunting life sciences is persistent as it is being, and as it has been, it will triumph. It will win. We will win. So thank you each and every one of you for the everything that you're doing in your area of expertise in your area of involvement because all of it, all of it comes together and we're all linked together by our actions, by our thoughts, by our compassion, by our deeds and uh, by the one thing that we have that our opposition does not have and that is a heart. Yeah. <laughs>